Lilac slumbers, but a rainy day. True, yet tired of tumultuous ways. Sent me swinging up as I can be. Fell down high, but with my dignity. Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Latin jazz singer Lauren Henderson. She is originally from Massachusetts, and today she is based in both New York City and Miami. She grew up studying piano and then later classical voice and musical theater in college. She presents her signature smoky vocals on her upcoming EP, Riptide. It will be coming out to the world on October 19, 2018 on Brontosaurus Records. This new release is electric and it's heavy with jazz influences that include both English and Spanish lyrics combining pop, nuevo flamenco, and soul. She spoke about this album, her career, and so much more. So please get to know her and dig this interview, my friends. Lauren, thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. I appreciate it. Oh, it's really my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I love your music, and I want to talk to you about a myriad of things, but let's start off with your upcoming EP, Riptide, coming out on October 19th. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a real mix of different flavors that go into this. There's jazz overtones, and there's all kinds of different things like flamenco and soul. Talk to me about this album and how happy you are about this. I'm really excited about this. Uh, Riptide is something very different from anything I've released. As you know, I come from a jazz and Latin jazz background, and of course I like to throw in a bit of flamenco and soul, but I think Riptide also brings a lot of contemporary flair, and it's very exciting. They're all original songs that I wrote, and I worked with some incredible musicians, pulling them together and getting them ready for a nice little story and message uh, through music. So I'm very excited to share it with everyone. And we're kind of tying up loose ends now to get it ready for release. So this is your fourth release. And I want to know, with the previous releases, how do you view each successive album? Do you see it as an evolution, a snapshot in time? What, what do you do as a musician that evolves over the years? Well, it's wonderful. I guess that's the great thing about releasing music and kind of seeing where it goes and who it speaks to. My first record, which was self-titled, was not really initially going to be released in the commercial sense. I was more going to use it for getting gates in New York and sort of establishing myself and kind of providing some sound examples to venues. But that was reviewed by Downbeat and it's it got a decent amount of exposure. And then for A La Madrugada, that's what I produced on my own. So I was happy to see that it charted when we first uh, released that. And that was a big step for me because it was my first time releasing uh, original music instead of only standards or my version of standards. So that was an interesting experimentation. And then having one of the songs, uh, one of my original tunes placed in a film was definitely a big moment for me, and I'm still very grateful for that. And then with um, Armame, which was released only in March, we have been very happy to be in the top 40 on the jazz chart, so I'm grateful for that. And I hope that people continue to listen and learn about the music. I think today it's wonderful that we have access to so many different artists and it's very easy for us to discover new people um, but there's so much content so there's a lot for people and tastemakers to sift through so I'm really excited about releasing the Tide I definitely hope to reach more audiences and and kind of expand uh, my my fan base a little bit it's a pretty big gateway to get a piece of music and film how how many doors did that open up for you how big was it it was very big. The producer of my last album, Mark Ruffin, actually had a lot to do with that. When he got my second album uh, through press and uh, my publicist, he was playing it quite a bit on serious jazz, which I was very grateful for. And he was also the music supervisor for The Drowning, which features Julia Stiles, and my song, Astonuka, um, seemed to fit very well in one of the scenes, so they ultimately did select it, which I was very excited about. 
it did open a lot of doors. It did expose me to different people and maybe some other people who hadn't heard of my music were a little more intrigued to learn more. So I would say that it was definitely helpful and I, I certainly wouldn't mind being placed again in another film if that if I'm so fortunate to have that opportunity. Right on. So let's go to the beginnings of your life here. You're originally from Massachusetts. That's right. Talk to yeah, talk to me a little bit about your family, how you got involved in music and more specifically jazz. Okay. Well, I grew up in Marblehead, Massachusetts, which is a very small town on the North Shore of Massachusetts, and I'm very close to my parents. I am the only child. I was also the only grandchild on my father's side, and we're very close. And my dad probably was playing jazz uh, when I was in the womb, so he has a really big uh, part and influence on my education in jazz and knowing songs and standards and great tunes. And then for Latin music, my mom has a great love and passion for Latin music and salsa, so I got a lot of that from her as well. And they're very excited that uh, I've pursued this career, so I'm grateful for that because when I told them that I wanted to do music full-time and see where it took me, they were very supportive, which is not always the case for some of my peers. So... I'm very grateful to them for their consistent support and encouragement. So you started studying piano, then you went into classical voice and then musical theater. Talk to me a little bit about your early evolution into becoming a singer. I studied piano, exactly, and I have to admit that sometimes between homework and middle school homework and high school homework and applying to college, I would not always come to my lessons prepared <laughs> with um, my with my music. So one day, my piano teacher said, "Well, okay, we've done enough of this. Do you want to try singing?" And I said, "Sure." And we sang a bit, and we did some warm ups, and she seemed very enthusiastic. So I was excited about that, and she shared her enthusiasm with my parents, but I was extremely shy. When I was in middle school and high school, I would be in kind of smaller singing groups and choral groups and musical theater, but I basically refused to sing a solo by myself. But my senior year of high school, we had to be, uh, we were doing auditions for Grease, the musical, and basically you couldn't you couldn't express what character you wanted to be, so they would just decide that for you. And so I was placed as lead after doing an audition, so I had to get over that very, very quickly and perform in front of the school and parents and whatnot. And so after that, I realized it wasn't so bad, and when I went on to Wheaton College in Massachusetts, I joined a singing group and jazz band and slowly shed the shyness, and then by the time I moved to New York City, after graduation, I started singing at jam sessions and going out to different clubs, and I basically realized that I could make a bit of money singing, so I started pursuing that. So when you finally did come to New York in 2010, you were in jam sessions, were you nervous? Was it kind of a, a big you're finally in the mecca of jazz, you're finally doing what you want to do, or was it just comfortable? Did it seem natural? I was so nervous. <laughs> huh. I was so nervous. And, you know, just as you said, the mecca of jazz. And I met so many people that I had grown up listening to. I met Peter Walton. I met Barry Harris. I sang for Barry Harris, which actually he's a big reason why I had the confidence to keep pursuing music because he was so enthusiastic when I went to his workshop about my voice and was very encouraging. So I thought, if he likes it, then I can't be that bad. Other people like Jane Monheit and Michael Kanan have been major mentors who have really kind of given me the encouragement that I need because with any field, you'll you'll hit bumps in the road and difficult situations. So it is important to have mentors and people you look up to who have positive feedback for you. Those are some pretty big names in the world of jazz. What did they teach you 
that you've remembered up to this point about how to carry yourself as a singer and in, in your career? What they've all taught me, which was something that I sincerely struggled with, was just being me. Nobody else can be me. Nobody else will present a song the way that I do because if I'm really internalizing it and making it my own, that's a very unique thing. And I think today this applies in so many situations, but as a young woman of color and and just a young person in general, we often doubt ourselves or we might think that we need to do more of this or more of that or be more like this person or person X. And I eventually saw that, you know, I'm not a belter, I'm not this, I'm not going to fit into the mold that other people may want me to be, but I can be me and I can do that well and authentically. And that tends to speak to the audience more. So it's almost like a bit of therapy in a way, but that's been really helpful because I think as a young singer and trying to fit any other aesthetics or, or approaches is wonderful and we should study these different approaches and, and tools as vocalists and as a, using the voice as an instrument and being versatile is very important. However, you know, being true to yourself is really essential. So are you based in both Miami and New York? Yes, I'm based in both Miami and New York, and I've been in Providence as well. I am also getting my MBA at Brown University as I continue with my career because my latest release is under my own record label, Brontosaurus Records, and I wanted to have a bit of a business background to kind of foster that career that I'm also pursuing, and it, I don't have any intention of stopping singing, but it's been great, and it's really been helping me manage the business aspects of my career, especially when I tour or leave the country or deal with uh, publishing and licensing and whatnot. It's really been helpful for my business. You've already etched a pretty good road in your music career up to this point, and obviously there's a lot more to go. Are you happy with what's happened up to this point? I am so happy with what's happened up to this point. I never imagined that uh, a lot of these things would would unfold, and I'm so grateful to the people who have supported me and given me opportunities and believed in my music and appreciated my sound. It really means the world to me, and I have millions of things that I would like to achieve. I feel like there are a lot more things that I could do to grow and develop, and I have every intention of pursuing those as well and hoping for the best. So let's say in about 10 years from now, we interview again, and I ask, first of all, what has been going on? What do you want to tell me? I want to tell you that I'm doing a lot of the same things, but bigger and better. So I'm getting ready, for example, to head to Europe, and I'll be performing in Italy and Spain and Germany and possibly France as well. And I hope to be doing that, but just with more dates and reaching more people, with more records released, and with more name recognition, with more people that I've been able to collaborate with and be inspired by, and just really still with a zest and passion for music and creating and writing. The one thing that's really big in the development, I think, of even a listener, but more specifically a performer, is those concerts that you've seen live, those performers you've seen live, specifically in the jazz idiom. Who have you seen live that really left a deep impact on you? Oh, so many people have left, you know, incredible impacts on me. I think uh, I've seen Dee Dee Bridgewater perform, and I've met her, and she's just a beautiful person inside and out. She's just so warm and encouraging to me, especially as a young singer. I've seen Cyrus Chestnut. I really love his playing. Seeing Peter Walton was amazing. Jason Moran. You know, of course, Barry Harris, as I mentioned, and Jane. The first time I saw Jane, I was just absolutely in love and it, then being able to sing for her and study with her was just a dream on another level and I'm so grateful to her today for her friendship and her advice and everything else. There are so many people that inspire me and a lot of my friends as well. Uh, I 
perform and record regularly with Phil and Fortner, and I find him very inspiring as well. And uh, uh, there are just so many great artists out there that really uh, take my breath away, for lack of a better phrase. So let me ask you this. If you could get a jazz DeLorean to pull up in front of your house and take you somewhere in the history of jazz, who would you want to go see live and where? I would really love to see Sarah Vaughn live and at a very intimate venue, maybe at the Village Vanguard. Uh, That would be amazing to meet her and just see her delivery. That would be a dream for me. One of the best anecdotes or one of those Norman Rockwell moments that were painted in my head, I I was fortunate enough to interview Michelle Coltrane, and she was living with Alice and John in in California, and one day she saw Sarah Vaughn ride by on a bicycle, and she just looked up at her mom and said, was that was that Sarah Vaughn? And she was like, yeah, she lives around here. And I've never got that image out of my head. It's just Sarah Vaughn in California, <laughs> mid-70s, riding a bike. And it's just like, that's all I needed right there. That's the end wow. of it. Wow. What a she great story. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, you know, you got to figure when you're talking to a coal train, they're talking about things like, you know, what the cuticles of God look like, like it's just like <laughs> the way we describe it. Like the way we describe a sandwich, you know, and it's like, right. oh, okay, cool, right on, let's move on. Let's oh yeah, move. she lives around here. <laughs> yeah, you know, she hangs out. They have a spot of tea. If things get bad, they have gin. It's like, you know, there's just you know, always some kind of thing. So it was, it was cool. It was a really cool story, and and that always got cemented in my head. There's always something that said that just is like a whammy to my head. And I'm like, wow, Sarah Vaughn on a bicycle. Like, what did the bike look like? Yeah. Was she wearing, <laughs> was she wearing pants? Did she have a dress on? Did she look like she was performing? Or did she get really, you know, like in, like, disguise mode? I don't know. So, anyway, <laughs> it, it was interesting. So, I'm going to move on here and ask you generically, why do you love jazz? Oh, I love jazz because... I feel like it's in my blood. It's something, it's it's so familiar to me. It's what I grew up with. It's, it's part of my culture. It's what I love, and there's something so beautiful and deep and dark and lovely and bright. It can be anything. It doesn't really have a clear definition. It doesn't have restrictive lines, depending on who you're talking to. And I think that uh, it's a wonderful form of expression and improvisation and a beautiful tool for young artists to express themselves in in different ways and expand on concepts and ideas and discover things about themselves in the process. Up to this point, you've learned from luminaries. You've been in film. You've been all over. You're between two major cities on the coast. You've seen kind of what's going on with jazz. How healthy is jazz as an organism in 2018? I think jazz is a beautiful organism, but we need support. We need people who are buying music. We need people who are coming to shows. We need people who are investing in projects. And we need uh, venues and, and other artists to also take a stand and protect musicians because of Times are are not easy, and it is difficult to make things stretch and to create music. You do need a bit of money, and which is not always there. So, and people don't always like talking about it, but it's just a fact. So, it is important for us to kind of keep this in mind, protect each other, make sure that we communicate uh, our needs and concerns, and you know, not being shy about mentioning what's uh, essential to creating and developing the field and, again, making sure that there is support in the community. It's a small community, and I think many people are encouraging and supportive of other people who are just taking the initial steps in their career and paying it forward if they can. Beautiful. So this is my final question, and I want to know, everyone has a version of you, your family, your friends, your fans, Mm -hmm. your business contacts, but you know you. 
You know yourself mm-hmm. best. Who do you think you are? I am me. I am just a, I think I'm a nice person. I think that I have a lot of uh, spunk and a little bit of sass. And I am really a romantic, I would say. I, I always want to do what I can to reach people and kind of touch their emotions and heart strength in any way I can. I really want to perform and be in the moment. I really want to make a difference with my music, as cliche as that might sound, but I want people to feel something when they listen to my music or have some type of reaction uh, that's strong and hopefully positive. Beautiful. Lauren, I think that's a great way to wrap everything up. Thank you for taking some time to talk about Riptide. Good luck with that release. And thank you for opening up about your life and music. Thank you very much for having me on Neon Jazz. It's so nice to speak with you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Miami, New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Lauren for her time, music, and all those stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. For everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Turn to things all my life is on the friends. It's through the time. It's through the real time. Neon Jazz.